Hello and welcome to the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum Free Sunday Lecture for the month of June 2024. And my name's Tom Sharpley and I'm the manager, the museum manager. And we'd like to thank our sponsors of the free lecture series, M&T Bank, AARP of Vermont, and North Country Federal Credit Union. Oh boy, and you want to hear about all the events that are coming up in the next two months. Boy, we're excited. So many exciting things are happening. I'm practically exhausted. Um, all right, next weekend. Oh boy, that's the big weekend. J June 22nd and 23rd is Ethan Allen weekend, and Warner's Regiment is going to be here camped out on the property for two days, shooting off their muskets. And then Sunday the 23rd, that's Ethan Allen day. And not only is Warner Reg Warner's Regiment going to be here, but Vermont residents get free admission to the museum. One day only, June 23rd, Ethan Allen Day. You know, that's the day Ethan Allen went and spoke in front of the, um, the First Continental Congress in Philadelphia after capturing Fort Ticonderoga. All right, so that's uh, June 22nd and 23rd. On July 21st, a month from today, we have our uh, lecture is going to be called Substance Abuse and Abortion, Surviving Health Challenges in 19th Century Vermont by Gary Shattuck, who has spoken here on a number of issues uh, before. And then, oh boy, on July 26th, oh, this is exciting. We're how, you know, we have a new movie about Fanny Allen Penniman uh, that, we, that we show to the visitors. And we're having the world premiere of that movie, the VIP premiere party, by invitation only. How can I get to go to that? How can I become a VIP? Well, you can become a member of the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. Out at the front desk, I have the membership forms. It's $20 for a senior, $25 for an adult, and $55 for a family for a, for a year's membership. And then you get to be a VIP, and you get to go to the, the, the glamorous film premiere uh, of our new Fanny Allen movie. So that's, uh, that's chill. All kinds of stuff. We're going to have the floodlights, everything. Uh, and then that is July 26th, and then July 27th and 28th is going to be Fanny Allen weekend. All right. And now I'm going to go to the storeroom and get some more folding chairs. But first, I'm going to introduce John Devineau, former, uh, uh, former president of the board and still an active board member of the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum and our longest standing volunteer. Still standing, Still standing, barely standing, yeah. All right, thank you all for, for coming today. Right, thank you, Tom. I am John, John Devineau. Um, first of all, happy Father's Day to all those of you in the audience that are fathers, grandfathers. Do we have any great-grandfathers? I have a classmate who's a great-grandfather. I don't know how he and I could be in the same class because uh, time does do things to us, right? So. So in college, I was a math major, not a history major. History has always been a, a sideline that I've enjoyed. I can think back to the first election that I remember participating in by writing down uh, totals as they came in, and that was the 1960 election. Do any of you remember 1960 out there? So, <laughs> and that was, uh, who were the... Uh, Participants? Kennedy and, Nixon. Kennedy and Nixon, right? And I remember, I still maybe have it in my basement, is a, uh, a sheet of paper where I was recording just the uh, popular vote as it was coming through. And my parents probably allowed me to stay up till, stay up late till probably nine or 10 o'clock at night uh, <laughs> recording the results. And I, if I recall the next day, I think the election was still somewhat in doubt. Yes. Yes. I recall it was a very popular vote, was very, very close, if I recall, yeah. And uh, I think that, that was the first election that all 50 states participated in, if I recall. I think Alaska and Hawaii were, the, were admitted at that time. So, so elections have always been a topic that has fascinated me. Um, going back to, uh, oh, uh, talking about uh, our vice president over here. I'm the president of the board, and Doug is the vice president of the board. And you may have heard those chants of hanging Doug Slaba that have been going through the Burlington area, but uh, we are going to get, you are going to get political, right? You have to, your topic is uh, political all the way, so. So let me give you a few, uh, few items about Doug. Uh, he grew up in Iowa and attended uh, Iowa State University for both his bachelor's degree and his master's degree. He then came east to New York State and got his doctorate from Cornell University. 
after stints of teaching at Cornell, Countley's, Texas Tech, Ithaca College, Wells College, and SUNY Cortland, you wonder if this person could keep a job, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> but he made up for it by spending, I think, 32 years at St. Michael's College, where he retired as Professor Emeritus. Uh, as a scholar, Doug specialized in the political history of the 20th century U.S. He has published a book, William L. Myers and the Modernization of American Agriculture, and a number of articles on subjects such as Adlai Stevenson, some of us remember him a little bit, right? Uh, the presidential campaigns of, and uh, William Myers, the uh, governor of the Farm Credit Administration during the New Deal. And he also published works on the social work in progressive era Cincinnati. So very well rounded in terms of American history and politics. So we know that the election of 1860, some of you remember that one? <laughs> As, uh, uh, that one led to the Civil War. But there were other elections that nearly led to the Civil War, and that's why we're all here today to, uh, to hear about this. So would you uh, join me in welcoming Doug as our speaker today? Thank you for coming out. It's a beautiful day, and you might find it uh, more interesting to be outside than to hear what I'm going to say, but I'll try not to bore you too much today. Um, I think as John mentioned, I used to teach a course on presidential elections. Can you speak uh, up a little louder or adjust the mic? Okay, so the I microphone can, is only for the camera recording, right? It does not have to. Okay, well I'll try to speak, speak more loudly. I, I used to regularly teach a course on presidential elections. And uh, one of my favorite courses, we would usually cover you know, the current election part of the time and then look at the history and try to give students context. Uh, one of the things that historians do is to try to explain context for events that happen to give them, uh, give people more understanding of what these events might have meant. And today I'm going to try to give you more context for these elections. We're going to be focusing on violence in presidential elections and why it happened in one case and why it almost happened but didn't in some others. If you take a look at the uh, picture on the left here, can anybody tell me what that statue is of? Anybody? You know, you can see the U.S. Capitol in the background, but there's a statue in the front. A guy on a horse. It's a guy on a horse. <laughs> this is actually the largest equestrian statue in the United States. John? Is it Jackson? No. Um, it's actually U.S. Grant. And uh, I had, you know, I wasn't familiar with this statue either until a few years ago. My wife and I had gone to Washington and we'd wandered around the mall, gone into some of the museums, and we sort of ended up at the, on the foot of Capitol Hill. And we saw this imposing statue. And it, it's really monumental. It's 17 feet high, made out of bronze. The, the pedestal that it's on is made out of Vermont marble. It's surrounded by these reclining lions. And on the sides, there are panels in bronze that depict Civil War battles. And this was, you know, maybe 20 years ago. But I remember thinking, you know, this is really kind of a wonderful spot for Grant to be sitting. Because during the Civil War, he literally protected Washington and the Capitol from the Confederate Army. You know, as late as the summer of 1864, General Jubal Early led uh, a Confederate army directly at Washington. They were hoping that maybe they could capture the capital. Maybe they could, you know, uh, put a shiver in, down the spine of Unionists. And Grant's forces protected the capital that day. January 6, 2021, we could see scenes like the one on the right. 
which to me was kind of shocking. And maybe it meant more to me as a historian, the idea that somebody would walk through the Capitol carrying a Confederate flag. It was a desecration. I wondered what U.S. Grant would have thought of that. Now, for most of our history, losing presidential candidates would have done everything in their power to avoid being tagged as a sore loser. You know, in Donald Trump's case, it didn't work that way. He kind of gloried in being someone who would not admit defeat and still does not. But we don't have to look that far into the past to see examples of losing presidential candidates who did accept defeat much more gracefully. I, I mentioned the case of Richard uh, Nixon in 1960, as, as John uh, mentioned before, it was a very close election. Uh, John Kennedy won by only about 100,000 votes. Nixon had reason to believe that Democrats had stolen votes in places like Cook County, Illinois, controlled by the Daily Machine, or in South Texas, where a Democratic machine allied with Kennedy's running mate, Lyndon Johnson, had a lot of power. Uh, Nixon clearly could have raised a stink about that. He didn't, partly perhaps because Republicans had stolen votes in other parts of the country, <laughs> but also, I think, because he wanted to maintain his political viability. He wanted to run for president again, but he didn't want to have this tag of sore loser attached to him because that would have hurt him. Uh, we expected presidents or would-be presidents to behave in a different way. A more recent example that I know you all probably remember, Al Gore in 2000. You know, go back in time and think about uh, the contested election in Florida, those crazy butterfly ballots and the hanging chads. Al Gore won 500,000 more votes than his opponent, George W. Bush. But it was very close in Florida. Gore challenged what was happening in the courts. He actually forced a recount for a time before it was finally short-circuited by the Supreme Court. But he could have done more. Uh, the Democratic activist and civil rights leader Jesse Jackson came down to Florida uh, in the wake of that election. He offered Gore uh, that he would lead demonstrations on his behalf. Gore, however, was afraid, well, what if a riot breaks out? This is not going to look good. This is going to be bad for me. It'll be bad for the country. He sent Jesse Jackson home. He pursued his opportunities all the way to the Supreme Court, but when he lost, he admitted defeat. He congratulated Bush. He had what would have had to be a very difficult moment the following January when as vice president he had to certify the vote for his opponent Bush and declare him the next president of the United States. But he did that. It didn't stop Republicans from calling him a sore loser and because of the names of Gore and his running mate, Republicans had a field day mocking them as the sore loser man ticket. And that was just because they actually contested the election in the courts, but they refused to use violence to try to win. Violence, however, was something that was uh, at least threatened more regularly in some of our earlier elections. And I want to turn now and look uh, at some of them and explain why in one case, uh, violence was unavoidable, but in other cases, although it was threatened, it didn't materialize. We want to try to figure out why that was. But before we get into specific elections, I want to say something about what the founders wanted, the people that wrote the Constitution. How did they design it for having a certain kind of person as president? And what was the process going to be for choosing that person. It has relevance for how elections would be conducted, obviously, and for a sort of ideal that we might have about how elections should be 
conducted and what the candidates should be like. Well, the Constitution was designed with George Washington in mind. The office of the presidency was designed for him. It was supposed to be for a person of great moral rectitude, a man, and of course it would have always been a man, a white man in those days, but a man of character, a man of good judgment, somebody that you could count on, uh, seemingly the best representative uh, of the American people that you could imagine. Washington's the model. And certainly in the early days, I think Americans wanted to have candidates. They might not be Washington again, but they would share some of his characteristics. They'd be as close to him as they possibly could get. Now the founders of the country were part of an elite. They were people of wealth, people of education, people of political and practical experience. They wanted to design a government where people like them would basically be making the decisions. You know, the Constitution was not written to mandate a democracy by any means. The founders were students of history. They understood that historically, attempts at democracy in places like Greece or Rome had ultimately failed. And they'd failed because demagogues had arisen who had mobilized popular mobs to take over, and they'd manipulated those mobs to stay in power. Uh, the example of Julius Caesar overthrowing the Roman Republic was very much on the minds of the founders. How could they create a government that could incorporate uh, popular views, popular opinion, but not allow popular opinion to be uh, the deciding factor? The feeling among the founders was that, you know, the people uh, have to be listened to, but we can't have them really directly choosing our leaders. And so they, they designed a system uh, in which you would have checks and balances. Presidents, for instance, would not be elected directly by the people. They created an electoral college that would be made up of people like the founders, the best white men in each state who would decide among a small group of leading people, educated, experienced, usually people of property, they would be the candidates that would be chosen. Uh, the rest of the government would also have its checks and balances. The House of Representatives, where the people could vote directly, they could have a certain amount of power, but you would have a Senate uh, made up of two senators from every state, again, chosen by state legislatures, not chosen directly by the people. It's not until uh, the early 20th century when the Constitution is, is amended that people could vote directly for senators. So senators are removed from you know, popular emotions and they're a check on uh, the House kind of getting carried away, making decisions. And then you had a Supreme Court, which is insulated supposedly from popular views chosen by the president with the approval of the Senate. All of these branches of government checking and balancing each other. The ideal is to have government that is following a moderate course. You're taking into account different points of view. You're, you're using your reason to come up with solutions to problems, but you're not going to one extreme or another. You're trying to think not about your own personal interest, or your local interest, but of the national interest. You know, a representative thinks about his own district, senators think about their own states, um, presidents have to think about the whole country, but collectively, they can serve the national interest. This means that you have a government that over and over again is going to be reaching decisions based on compromise. You're always having to give up some of what you want accept some of the things that your opponents want, and agreeing to disagree, agreeing that, well, at the next election, we'll try to get more, more of our people in office, and then we, we can do more of what we want. But we're going to be patient. We're not going to demand everything now. The biggest compromise that the founders had to deal with was over the question of slavery. 
This could have destroyed the United States in the very beginning. Southern slaveholders would not have agreed to even join the United States if the Constitution was not seen as protecting their institution. Uh, Northerners, because of their fear that a, a divided uh, America right off the bat would make it much easier for foreign powers like Britain to come in and try to take us over again, eager to make compromises with the South on this issue of slavery. And a classic example of that will be the creation of the Three-Fifths Compromise. Three-Fifths Compromise is where you decide that you're going you're to count for electoral, electoral purposes the bodies of enslaved people, they can't vote of course, but for like choosing uh, representatives, you're going to count them as three-fifths of a person. This is going to add to the uh, power that the South will have in the House. It will help ensure that candidates sympathetic to the South have a greater edge in the Electoral College. It's one of the reasons that up until the Civil War, almost all presidents elected are either slaveholders or they're people who are sympathetic to the South. There are a few Northern Northerners, Northern Democrats who would be elected who are sympathetic to the South and to slavery. So slavery is going to be protected, but that's the price, that's the compromise price initially for maintaining union. Well, let's look at our first election here. The founders had initially hoped to avoid parties, or factions as they called them. To them, factions was one of the great detriments of the British Parliament. People joining these parties so that they could gain some kind of advantage for financial reasons or just to hold a political party. They wanted the best men up there doing what was best for the country, not thinking just about themselves. But even in Washington's first administration, parties are beginning to form. Uh, parties that are more supportive of Washington led by his Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, will create what are known as the Federalists. They believe in a strong uh, national government. Their opponents who wanted a weaker government, who only supported the Constitution after it was agreed, another compromise, that we would add a, a Bill of Rights protecting you know, your individual right to free speech and religion and to, uh, you know, possess a firearm, perhaps. Um, that brought them into the government. But they generally wanted a weaker national government, more power given over to the states. This group, this faction, led by Thomas Jefferson and his close colleague, James Madison. Federalist Republicans. This is the first American party system active in the 1790s. They were divided on all kinds of issues. The Federalists uh, tilted a little bit toward Britain. Britain and France are the great powers in the world in those days. Republicans tilt toward France. Thomas Jefferson had been minister to France at the time of the French Revolution. Very sympathetic to it, thought that it, you know, they were simply uh, taking, you know, going one step uh, beyond the United States and their, re their revolution. When it became violent, then Republicans began to step back from, from uh, supporting France. There were some very contested issues. Uh, after 1796, after Washington retires, succeeded by his vice president, John Adams, uh, Adams, uh, who was uh, more supportive of Britain, uh, put off by the French, felt that the, you know, that the French were trying to undermine uh, America. Uh, he got his allies in Congress to pass the Alien and Sedition Acts, one of the worst uh, pieces of legislation Congress ever passed, clearly unconstitutional, basically making it a crime to criticize the president, criticize his policies. And people went to jail for doing this. We have a, you know, a Vermont example that some of you might be aware of. Remember who the Vermont congressman who went to jail for criticizing Adams was? Matthew Lyons. Matthew Lyons, down in, down in Virginia. He was in prison for a while. You know, 
the Republicans thought this is a law just aimed at us, trying to make it impossible for us to um, you know, say anything bad about Adams. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison would actually issue statements. Um, uh, Jefferson would write what was called the Kentucky Resolutions, and Madison would write the Virginia Resolutions. These were issued by the legislatures in those states, but Jefferson and Madison actually wrote them. The basic argument of these resolutions was the doctrine of nullification, which you may have, may have heard of. This is the idea that if a state does not like some kind of federal law, they can nullify it within the borders of their state. We're just not going to follow it. You know, we don't like your tax policy. We just won't apply it here. Um, nullification would be an argument of later politicians like John C. Calhoun, used by a lot of other Southern uh, uh, polit political leaders who didn't like the direction the country was going in. And you can see secession in effect as a kind of outcome of this idea of nullification. Um, we see nullification even in our own time. You may have heard about um, uh, some Republican states that are sending National Guardsmen to the border in Texas. Uh, they don't trust the federal government to provide secure borders, so they're taking it upon themselves to take over a job that historically has always been given over to the federal government, <coughs> making sure there's a secure border. So the, you know, the idea of nullification certainly has not disappeared. Beside these issues in the campaign of 1800, uh, 1800 can seem like a very modern campaign because they're very bitter personal attacks. Uh, Jefferson is attacked by the Federalists as an atheist who say that if he's elected, God's going to condemn the United States. Americans are all going to go to hell. Uh, John Adams would get his, too, though, in the campaign. He would be accused of being a closet monarchist, somebody who, if he could just have his way, he'd end up as a king. Now, in the election itself, Jefferson is going to win the most popular votes. Not every state would have popular votes to choose electors, but in those that did, Jefferson did pretty well, better than Adams. He also won more electoral votes. But he didn't win a majority. You have to have a majority of electoral votes to become president. This means, according to the Constitution, that the House of Representatives has to decide. The top two uh, electoral college vote winners would be the two choices. Now, in this election, uh, Thomas Jefferson and the man that it was assumed would be his running mate as vice president, Aaron Burr of New York, they both end up with the same number of electoral votes. John Adams comes in third, so he's kind of out of the running. The reason that there is a tie in the Electoral College is because one of the Republican electors forgot or made a mistake. He should have voted for some other person so that Jefferson would have had one more vote than Burr did. But for whatever reason, that didn't happen, so they're tied. And this makes for kind of an uncomfortable decision because normally it would have been expected that Aaron Burr would have con congratulated Jefferson and acknowledged he was going to be the president and Burr himself was going to be vice president, but Burr didn't do that. And ever since then, historians have been trying to figure out what was going through Aaron Burr's mind. Was he betraying Jefferson? Was he ready to make a deal with the Federalists who couldn't perhaps choose one of their own, but if they could make a deal with Burr, maybe he would support some of their policies? They might, that might not be such a bad outcome. Well, the House is kind of at an impasse. A choice is delayed for weeks and weeks, and in those days, the new president is inaugurated on March 4th. You've got to have a decision by then, but it didn't look like Maybe it was going to happen. So-called ultra-federalists who really hate the Republicans, they really hate Jefferson, 
they're trying to figure out what can we do. Is there some maneuver we can make that can allow us to have one of our own stay in power? Um, could we have a new election? Could we somehow elevate one of our leading political officials to be president? This would have all been unconstitutional, but this kind of talk is going around. Jefferson hears of this, and as you can imagine, he's not happy about it. He says, this will mean civil war. And he went further. He urged southern states, Republican states generally, to get their militias ready, to march on Washington, to use force if necessary to make him the president. And we might wonder, how serious was Jefferson about this? If you take a look at the quotation to the left, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this is one of the more famous lines that Jefferson ever wrote. Mm -hmm. Ironically, it was in a letter that he wrote to John Adams' son-in-law back in the 1780s, speculating on the possible need for there to be violence in American politics periodically to kind of make sure that uh, things were going properly, that the popular will was being served. You know, and he, he said famously, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. In 1800, you could wonder if Jefferson really believes this, we could be in for something um, that we couldn't really predict how it would play out. The United States was just beginning. Were we going to start deciding our elections by bloodshed instead of by voting? I mean, that had been the ideal of the founders that unlike so many countries historically, they changed leaders because they stage a coup, they have a war. Americans wanted to be different, but would it happen? How serious was Jefferson? when he wrote this. Well, we can look at his most famous utterance, all men are created equal. These are the words of a man who owned human beings. All men are created equal, but I can own slaves. As it turns out, of course, Jefferson wasn't entirely serious with that violent threat. Still, a stalemate persists. And rumors among Republicans are just kind of running wild. Some of them are speculating that uh, the Federalists are ready to arm rebellious slaves. In the summer of 1800, there was a huge conspiracy among slaves living in Richmond, Virginia to rise up and kill their masters. If this had played out, it would have been a very bloody affair. As it was, the plot was discovered early the leaders were summarily executed. <clears throat> Southern slaveholders for the rest of the 19th century are living with the dread that their slaves are going to murder them. You know, there's kind of a legend that slavery was kind of a nice institution. Slaves were well treated. They were happy. The reality was something a little different. And the slave owners knew this. The last thing they want is for rebellious slaves to be getting guns. There are also rumors that the Federalists are going to seize the arms of Southern militias so they couldn't protect themselves. You know, they wanted to be able to exercise their Second Amendment rights. You know, our current Supreme Court kind of ignores the opening lines of the Second Amendment, which talks about the need for a rel well-regulated militia. That's why you might need a gun. But in early American history, these militias were seen as critical as a kind of check on the federal government. If the federal government gets too much out of line, we have militias that we might use. But certainly in the South, the militia were critical for keeping the slaves in line. You know, you need organized white men to keep those slaves in their place. If the Federalists were messing around with this, this could be very dangerous indeed. There are even rumors that the Federalists were ready to murder Jefferson. So we're, be, you know, we're beginning to go off the deep end here. 
And it's not clear that these rumors were all that serious, but some people were believing them. And in the background, there's the fact that Aaron Burr seems to be meeting with the Federalists, plotting with them, trying to keep the most popular candidate from becoming president. Ultimately, of course, a deal was made. Southern Republicans who might be ready to you know, go to war to make Jefferson president start having second thoughts when they start thinking, well, gee, if, if the whites, North and South, start fighting with each other, maybe this will only encourage slaves to rebel. That'd be a terrible thing. We can't do that. Federalists are also start negotiating with Jefferson himself, not just Burr, trying to reach a deal. It's ultimately only because Alexander Hamilton intervenes that a deal is made. Now, Hamilton, he was, you know, Jefferson's political enemy. He didn't like Jefferson. He thought he would be a poor president. But he liked Aaron Burr even less. You know, if you, you're familiar with the, you know, the musical Hamilton, you have some sense of the relationship of Hamilton and Burr, and it's, I think, pretty accurate in in displaying that. Um, these men had both been young officers under Washington in the Revolution. They'd been young lawyers in New York City afterward. They'd actually worked together. You could have said they were friends at one time. But Hamilton began to believe that Burr was a man with no character. He was so totally out for himself. You couldn't trust anything that he said or did. He didn't like Jefferson, but he at least thought, well, Jefferson is a man of his word, he's a man of character, he'd be a far better president than Aaron Burr. So he makes a deal that's going to make it possible for Jefferson to become president. Jefferson would deny it, but historians believe that he ends up making a compromise with the Federalists. He becomes president, but he retains many of their key economic policies many of which had actually been designed by Alexander Hamilton as Secretary of the Treasury, having a national bank to help regulate our finances a bit, taking on a national debt, which is a way to uh, be able to get investors to come in and help with the economic development of the country. Jefferson's going to continue this, at least for a while. He's also going to retain Federalist officials in office, at least for a while. It will also help him that both John Adams and Alexander Hamilton will retire from politics and give him a freer hand than he might have had otherwise. So what are the consequences? One of the key things to come out of this election is that we have a workable, peaceful transfer of power from one party to another. This hadn't happened before. That's a principle that will guide us right up until the present. We also get the passage of the Twelfth Amendment, which will recognize the existence of political parties. When candidates run for office, you have to state, I'm running for president or I'm running for vice president. You can't pull an Aaron Burr anymore. You also, of course, have the beginning of the destruction of Burr's uh, reputation. In 1804, he will fight a duel with Hamilton. As you might be aware, he kills him. And then a few years later, he leads an effort to uh, take a portion of what was then the southwestern United States along the Mississippi River uh, away and create a kind of empire that he would run as an emperor. This plot fails. He's tried for treason, acquitted barely and decides it's maybe better for him just to spend the rest of his life in Europe. Let's move on to 1824. Two leading candidates, John Adams' son, John Quincy Adams, and then Andrew Jackson of Tennessee. This is actually a four-man race because at this time, uh, the Federalist Party has disappeared. They don't run any more candidates after 1816. It's all Republicans all the time. Even John Quincy Adams, son of the only Federalist president, um, switches parties. He becomes a Republican. They're all Republicans, although their views on issues can vary. 
Adams had been the Secretary of State. Uh, Jackson, of course, is the hero of the Battle of New Orleans. He's seen in some regards as another military hero like George Washington, although his personality is uh, rather different and uh, can be used against him. Henry Clay, one of the savviest politicians in American history, Speaker of the House. William Crawford, Secretary of the Treasury, widely uh, respected. Uh, all men, certainly with qualifications for the highest office. Important issues of the day. Uh, Adams and Clay were great believers in having a strong national government that could direct um, national economic development. Uh, the so-called American system, where the government would funnel money into the uh, building of canals and bridges, later railroads, to further economic development. Jackson believed in economic development too, although he was more in favor of it happening at the state level. Uh, Crawford, more of a straight states' rights man, and he actually was the favorite of Thomas Jefferson. Now, during the course of the campaign, Crawford will suffer a stroke, so he's kind of out of the competition. Clay proves not to be as competitive as Jackson in the, the western states are gaining more and more political power. It ends up really being a race between Jackson and Adams. And Jackson comes out with the most votes and the most electoral votes, but not enough electoral votes to be elected president. So once again, the election's going to go into the House. It's here that Henry Clay, he's out of the running, but he's got a lot of influence, and he's able to get his supporters to back Adams and make Adams president. Um, they agree on the issues. They kind of agree that uh, Jackson, who has a reputation for being kind of violent, hot-tempered man, really doesn't have the character. You know, he might be Washington as a general, but he's not Washington in terms of his, his character and his demeanor. Um, when Adams is president, he turns around and makes Clay his Secretary of State, which in those days was often a stepping stone to becoming president. This outrages Jackson. He's the more popular candidate. He feels he should be going to the White House. And you might wonder, given his personality, would he be ready to stage a coup? It's no accident that it's been said Donald Trump's favorite president was Andrew Jackson, because he was a strong leader. He was somebody who didn't let the rules get in his way when he really wanted something. And so you might, at this point, looking back on Jackson, wonder, is he ready to stage a coup to get into the, house, the White House? He clearly had supporters who would have followed him if he'd been ready to employ violence to get what he wanted. How, in fact, did Jackson behave? Well, the night Adams was elected, <coughs> Jackson went to a reception for Adams where he congratulated him. Not exactly the behavior of somebody who wants to stage a coup. He did not call for violence to overturn the election. His, his supporters were upset, but they didn't do anything about it. What he did was instead the classic thing that you're supposed to do if you lose election, if you want to continue in politics. You organize your supporters to do better in the next election. He was able to stymie a lot of Adams' program uh, as, in Washington, uh, and then that made it easier, plus his organizing, to win a triumphant victory in 1828. He bided his time. He won it all eventually. What are the consequences? Well, once again, we have a candidate who accepts the peaceful transfer of power despite having some good reasons to feel like I got shortchanged here. This election, because you have uh, a leading candidate, one who gets the most votes, if not quite enough, being denied, will lead to, within the next 10 or so years, all of the electors to the Electoral College being chosen by direct votes rather than by state legislatures. 
property requirements for voting, which had been very common early on, are virtually eliminated. So that by the 1840s, virtually all white men over 21 can vote. And finally, we see the emergence of a new party system, the second American party system. Supporters of Jackson will become the Democrats. And there's a direct line between the Jackson Democrats and the modern Democratic Party, although there'll be a lot of uh, changes in the sort of policies they support. Opponents of Jackson will come to call themselves Whigs, which is the name for the opposition party in the 18th century parliament. You had the dominant Tories and then the opposition Whigs. Now we get up to 1860. This, of course, is the election that leads to civil war. In this election, the overriding issue is slavery in the territories. The United States, because of the Louisiana Purchase under Jefferson, uh, the victory over Mexico and the war with them in the 1840s, you know, basically the, the continental United States is now complete. But it's unsettled territory. It's just Indians out there to be moved aside or killed um, to make way for white people. But what kind of economic system would you have out there? Would you have slave labor? Would you have free labor? Those were the stakes. The great proponent of making the West an area for free labor was this man, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, the Whigs would disintegrate in the 1850s, torn between divisions over slavery, northern Whigs uh, tending to be opposed, southern Whigs favoring it. Uh, these old Whigs, Lincoln had been a Whig himself, will create this new party they call the Republican Party. It's not the Jefferson Republican Party, it's quite different. In fact, in policy terms, it's more actually like the Federalists had been. Their overriding issue is keeping slavery out of these territories. Now Jefferson is a constitutional moderate. He believed that the Constitution protected slavery where it was, but that Congress had the power to keep slavery out of new territories. They'd already done this with uh, the so-called Northwest Territories, the, in our time the states around uh, the Great Lakes. Congress in the 1790s mandated that when these areas were organized as states, they could not have slavery. Jefferson, uh, Lincoln said, in these new western territories as they become states, they should all be free states. But he tried to convince the South that, you know, I'm not gonna bother slavery where it already exists, we're just gonna keep it out of the West. One of his great opponents, Stephen A. Douglas, from, also from Illinois. Uh, Douglas had defeated Lincoln in a race for the Senate in 1858. One of the most powerful senators in Washington. He thought he had a solution to the problem of slavery in the territories. The solution was popular sovereignty. Letting the people on the ground in these territories decide, do we want slavery or not? Douglas hoped, well, this would solve the problem. This will make me president. Now, in practice, it didn't work out so well. When they had tried popular sovereignty in the Kansas Territory, it led to a kind of civil war in miniature. Pro-Southern groups going into the state, pro or anti-slavery groups like John Brown and his men going into Kansas, fighting with each other, murdering each other. That's why they, they started talking about bleeding Kansas. Uh, the Democratic Party in this election doesn't break apart the way the Whigs do, but it does, in effect, split into two regional groups. Douglas becomes the candidate of Northern Democrats. The candidate of Southern Democrats is this man. He's the sitting vice president, John Breckinridge. He supported popular sovereignty. He'd support anything that would allow slavery to spread, but above all, Slavery has to be acceptable, at least in parts of the Western Territory. It's something that you really can't compromise. And then finally, there was John Bell of Tennessee, who's kind of an interesting character. A uh, man with many uh, qualifications on his resume, former Whig, 
Above all else, Bell wanted to preserve the Union. Um, he believed, like Lincoln, Constitution protects slavery where it existed, but he didn't think it really mattered if it wasn't allowed to spread. He could accept that. If it would maintain the Union, have a little slavery, he could go for it. And the outcome of the election is a pretty obvious victory for Lincoln. He only gets about 40% of the vote, but he gets a strong majority in the Electoral College, so he's going to become president. But you can see the, the states in red uh, voted for Lincoln. He doesn't get any uh, states south of the Mason-Dixon line. They're all going for somebody else, mostly for Breckenridge. The country is clearly divided. And that was the great question initially. Um, there are efforts to try to hold the Union together by people uh, like Douglas, Bell, trying to talk uh, to Southerners about the need to maintain the Union one way or another. They both were ready to accept uh, some kind of uh, slave system. Uh, Breckenridge also wanted to stay in the Union initially. But as more and more southern states secede in the wake of Lincoln's election, Breckinridge is going to join the new Confederacy. He ultimately becomes a general in the Confederate Army. Lincoln's going to be president having to deal with this mess. He tried to uh, be open to some kind of compromise, but the South wasn't having any of it. He eventually is going to have to preside over a war to bring uh, the South back into the Union. And ultimately, of course, this war will end slavery. What are the consequences? Well, it's pretty clear that although compromise normally is desirable, there's some issues that simply cannot be compromised. Um, Henry Clay had led major efforts in 1820 with the Missouri Compromise, in 1850, to try to hold the Union together with compromises on slavery that allowed a growing number of slave states, but at least an equal number of free states. Slave owners believed that if they could at least maintain, maintain a veto in the Senate, they could prevent Congress from ever trying to abolish slavery. But if they can't continue to grow, you know, the anti-slavery forces would just get stronger and stronger, and ultimately it would hurt the slave owners. Even Lincoln, of course, recognizes that some things can't be compromised, and you might have heard of his famous house divided speech. A house divided against itself cannot stand. And ultimately, of course, the Union will be restored, but it's going to take a very catastrophic war to do it. Slavery will be abolished. The Constitution will be amended three times to provide protections for the former slaves. One of the questions in the years after the Civil War, of course, would be, how long would white people be willing to make sacrifices to protect the rights of slaves, <coughs> former slaves and their descendants? And certainly by 1876, this is a big issue. Here are main candidates, Rutherford B. Hayes, and Samuel Tilden. What's the political situation in 1876? Well, our friend General Grant has, is just finishing up his second term as president. Fairly popular president. Um, but his government had been plagued by scandals, one scandal after another. Uh, some members of his cabinet even go to prison because of their involvement. Another is on the verge of being impeached before, he's, uh, before he resigns. Biggest scandal of his second term was the so-called whiskey ring, where high-ranking government officials were caught taking bribes from liquor manufacturers to avoid paying the national tax on alcohol. Even Grant's personal secretary is caught up in this scandal. And although historians don't believe Grant himself was taking money, he actually personally testified at his secretary's trial that he was a, a person of high moral character. Uh, it didn't look good. 
Uh, Grant wanted a third term. He wanted to stay in the White House. But this corruption issue becomes so big that uh, Republicans cannot nominate him again. In fact, both parties are under a lot of pressure to nominate candidates who are seen as corruption fighters. Rutherford B. Hayes, who had been a general in the Union Army, wounded five times in battle. He came out during the campaign as an advocate for civil service reform and getting rid of the spoil system. Spoil system had been created by Andrew Jackson. When he became president, he fired all of his political opponents and brought in good Jackson Democrats, and this became the norm. Uh, the best example of this happening was in the post office in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Every time a new administration would come to power, all the, all the postal workers would be fired if they were part of the wrong party, and supporters of the new administration, they would get those jobs. Well, Hayes says, let's, you know, let's get rid of that. Let's choose people for these jobs based on merit. Now, Hayes could talk the talk about fighting corruption. But Tilden really walked the walk as both a district attorney and then as governor of New York. He's responsible for putting the notorious boss Tweed of Tammany Hall and some of his cronies in jail. He broke up uh, the notorious Erie Canal uh, group that was siphoning money uh, used for maintenance and improvements in the canal into their own pockets. So he was doing the job. He was putting the corrupt in jail. Corruption's a huge issue. But the other great issue is reconstruction and what to do about it. Even before the Civil War ended, radical elements of the Republican Party who dominate Congress, because all the Southern Democrats have left the government, joined the Confederacy, or virtually all of them, uh, Republicans are thinking about when we restore the Union, how can we reform these southern states to ensure they don't rebel again and to ensure that former slaves now have rights? What they want to do is to be uh, protecting rights of the former slaves, in particular their right to vote, even using federal troops in the southern states who are going to continue occupying parts of the South uh, until the late 1870s. Uh, the original Ku Klux Klan uh, develops among ex-Confederates to try to intimidate uh, black people in the South. General Grant uses the Federal Army to destroy that Klan and to keep blacks protected so they can elect officials, they can send representatives to Congress, they can elect uh, various officials, even governors as well. They will campaign against uh, the Democrats as traitors. This will go on for the rest of the century. You can't vote for the Democrats if you live in the North. They're the party of treason. You know, if you put them in charge, it's like making Jefferson Davis run the government now. They would wave the bloody shirt, and on the left, you can see uh, this cartoon showing some of his colleagues trying to put a bloody shirt on a reluctant Rutherford B. Hayes. Um, you, this is a way of saying that, uh, you know, Southerners were responsible for all uh, the death and destruction of the war. Um, we can't let them run things again. Democrats, from their perspective, uh, had never liked Reconstruction to begin with. They weren't interested in particular in protecting black rights. They want to get rid of Reconstruction. They want to turn civil rights policy over to the states and let Southern whites kind of run things as they see fit. The first outcome of the election of 1876 is that Tilden is the more popular vote getter. He wins a quarter of a million more votes than Hayes does. And he leads in the Electoral College. He's only one vote short of being elected president. 
But there are all these electoral votes that are contested. Florida, Louisiana, South Carolina, all of their electoral votes, and then one in Oregon. Without a majority in the Electoral College, the election once again goes to the House of Representatives. Now the election itself was anything but fair. Both sides had used various kinds of violence and intimidation uh, to sway the vote. Democrats had used mob violence at black polling places. There was one uh, infamous incident where a group of whites trained a cannon on a black polling booth just to send a message to potential black voters, if you try to vote, <coughs> something bad might happen to you. Republicans had it a little easier. They had federal troops that could be used. And these troops would literally march black men to the polls to vote, to be sure they'd vote the right way. Not that they weren't probably more inclined to vote for Republicans who wanted them to have rights as opposed to Democrats who did not. Both sides were also paying voters to, to vote their way. Historians have estimated that in a free and fair election, Hayes probably have won, would have won South Carolina and the one disputed vote in Oregon, but Tilden would have won Louisiana and Florida and thus the election. He only needed one electoral vote. Well, election's gonna have to be decided in the House of Representatives. But the House has a real job here because all of these contested states are sending two sets of electors. Are you gonna decide that the Republicans should be picked or the Democrats? Congress is at an impasse. They don't know what to do. So they do what Congress often does when it can't reach a decision. They create a commission to study the problem and to, in most cases, issue a recommendation in this case, it's actually to decide the election. They're going to create an ad hoc electoral commission. I guess you can't quite see all this, but there would be 15 people on this commission. Seven Democrats, seven Republicans, one independent. Made up of five members of the Senate, five members of the House, and five members of the Supreme Court. Now it was assumed that the, you know, the Democrats would vote for the Democratic candidate, the Republicans would vote for the Republican candidate, but you had to have one person, independent, that you could count on to let the chips fall where they may and just make the right decision. Look at these contested delegations and decide which ones were most deserving. The person chosen to be that independent was a member of the Supreme Court, Justice David Davis, friend of Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln had appointed him to the court widely respected, not just by Republicans, but also by Democrats, as a person that could, you know, look at the situation and decide what's the right thing to do. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Davis doesn't stay on the Electoral Commission. The legislature in Illinois, they had a vacancy to fill and they elect Davis to be their new senator. So he has to drop out. He's gonna be replaced by another Republican Justice, Joseph Bradley. Now Bradley promised publicly that he would let the chips fall where they may. But as it turned out, in every dispute, he sides with the Republicans. He's gonna make Rutherford B. Hayes president. He will win every disputed vote and win the Electoral College by one vote. As you can imagine, Democrats not happy. They cry foul. Some of them say, we need to kill Hayes. The House of Representatives, which was controlled by Democrats, they pass a resolution declaring that Tilden is the duly elected president. In a number of Democratic states in the South, you see the creation of so-called Minutemen clubs, arming themselves, issuing these threats, on to Washington, Tilden or blood. Now ultimately, politicians are gonna to come to terms with the idea of Hayes winning this election. An important factor is that Tilden rejects violence. 
Tilden was no demagogue. You know, he'd been a lawyer all his life. He believes in the Constitution. He believes in the rule of law. You know, he, he feels that he was cheated to the, you know, till his dying day, Tilden believes he deserved to be president. But he's not going to fight this. Hayes, as it turns out, could be an acceptable president for many Democrats. He had announced even before the election that he was in favor of ending Reconstruction. That's an important issue for uh, Democrats, and especially for Southern Democrats. It also uh, appeared that Hayes might be better for Southern economic development. South's economy is literally destroyed by the war. It's going to be generations. It's not really going to be until World War II that the South begins to get back on its feet economically. Southern leaders are desperate for investment, desperate for economic aid. It's thought that Hayes would be more likely to give such aid to the South. The Democrat Tilden has a reputation for being a penny pincher. You know, it's, it's part of his effort to fight corruption. If you've got a lot of money being thrown here and there, there are too many opportunities for people to be corrupt. But you could make an argument that as far as Southern economic development is concerned, maybe Hayes would be better. Now, all during this time, secret negotiations are being carried about among Southern and Northern political leaders. And they come up with what historians come to refer to as the Compromise of 1877. Democrats are going to accept a Republican victory in the election. <clears throat> But Hayes, in turn, will do a lot of things that the, the South wants. Pull the remaining federal troops out of the South. Appoint at least one Southerner to, to his cabinet. And push for educational and economic uh, development aid to the South. What are the consequences? Hayes, like Jefferson, shows that you can reach a peaceful conclusion to a contested election by persuading your opponents that you can work with them. They accept your election. You agree to support some of their policy positions. It's also critical. Tilden refuses to be a demagogue. If he'd had a different personality, maybe he would have been. But fortunately, he did not. It's very important that fears of a possible civil war <clears throat> are going to be quashed. That was a real concern, especially in the North. People just they did not want to go through the bloodshed, the destruction that had characterized the Civil War again. This kind of deal much more acceptable to them. Keep the peace governed from the middle, not from the extremes. Now, there are victims of this compromise. You could argue that for white people, pretty good thing in a lot of ways. For the freedmen, for black people, not so much. Civil rights policy turned over to southern states dominated by former Confederates who are basically ready to treat black people like slaves, although you're not going to call them that. You're going to design what comes to be known as the Jim Crow system of segregation. Black people are going to be second-class citizens. Their rights are not going to be protected either by Congress. Congress will make some efforts. Supreme Court, which is dominated by uh, justices who are sympathetic to the South, will rule these efforts unconstitutional. Um, uh, Supreme Court will not. Uh, support any sort of effort to protect rights. The most notorious example will be the Plessy decision, 1896, that justified uh, racial segregation, separate but equal. Never was equal, but if you called it that, it was uh, acceptable. In return, you know, the American economy is going to take off like a rocket. By 1900, we have the largest economy in the world highest standard of living in the world. Not everybody's rich, 
<coughs> if people have more money, people are doing better. The United States is poised to become a world power. You know, if these politicians in 1876 hadn't been ready to reach the compromise that they did, that kind of development might clearly have been hindered. Now, in our own time, we wonder, will there be another insurrection? I read about a recent poll where people will ask if they thought we'd have another civil war. 40% said within the next 10 years, they thought we would. Kind of a startling statistic, and it's hard to know if people were completely serious about this, but there it is out there. We still have General Grant there on his horse protecting the Capitol. He wasn't able to keep the mob away in 2021, but he's still there. He's looking out across the mall toward the Lincoln Memorial, toward his commander in chief. I guess, you know, what we're left with in a sense is the hope that our own leaders today can act in the spirit of General Grant and in the spirit of Abraham Lincoln and do things that serve the interests of the entire country and not just certain groups or certain individuals. So thank you for coming. I enjoyed talking to you. I guess if you know, anybody has any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Then can you repeat the question so that uh, people who are uh, watch this on a record, recorded version can hear the question? I will, yeah. So I noticed Hayes versus Tilden. Tilden was one electoral college vote shy of 185. In the, um, some of the earlier elections, it seemed that the winning candidate had a plurality of the electoral votes, but not a majority. At what what election did that, at what point did that change? Did you know? Um, <clears throat> well, the question is about the electoral college and I guess how many votes you needed to become president. You've always had to have a majority. Oh, so they just had to negotiate until they had a majority in the early elections where there were multiple candidates and people fell far short. The way the system is set up, um, when, when, if an election reaches the House, the, each state uh, is able to cast one vote. And it's based on the number of senators and representatives that you have. But those senators and representatives have to agree among themselves uh, before they can have an official vote. Now this gives inordinate power to small states because they have as much, you know, Vermont has as much power as California. And um, in our current political environment, it gives great power to the Republicans who tend to be dominant in those small rural states. So that if an election would go into the House, at this point, it's almost certain that the Republican candidate would be, be chosen. Not that this is anything new. Partisans tend to vote for their fellow party members. One of the things that the um, founders hoped to avoid, just elect the best person, rather than you know, the, the person that's closest to you politically. Do you think there's any possibility of change of this system? Do I think there's any possibility of changing the system? You mean specifically the electoral mm -hmm. college? Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of people would like to do that. And almost, after almost every election, we hear some talk of doing this. But it's very hard. You'd have to amend the Constitution, um, which probably is not going to happen. Um, our Politics is so divided now. You know how difficult it is for Congress to agree on doing things. It seems to take almost superhuman effort to get an agreement to do something. And a constitutional amendment would require 
what is it, three quarters of the states to agree. And you'd have to have a super majority in Congress supporting it. So practically, it's not going to happen. There is an effort that has been making some progress where state legislatures, and I think they're all states dominated by Democrats, um, would agree that um, when a majority of states had accepted this idea of all the state's electoral votes going to the candidate that wins the majority of national votes, then you could, you know, in a sense, get around the electoral college requirement. There are questions about whether this would be constitutional. I mean, the Supreme Court could strike down an effort like this. So it's not clear. But I think currently there are, there are a handful of states that have got on the bandwagon, you know, like six or eight. It's not in the, the self-interest of Republican states to support this. It's much more in the interest of Democratic states. It's ironic in a way because, you know, the founders wanted to have government in which you're always making compromises. But they may have also created a system in which compromise becomes almost impossible. Uh, oh, you know, we, we all like to think that we want to have popular rule and we want the people to be deciding things. But we're partly in the mess we're in today because we've given a lot of rein to popular rule and to the people deciding. And I'm sure you're different. You don't make decisions based purely on emotion. But there are people that do. There are people that follow leaders because it feels right to them, not because it necessarily is uh, in the interests of the, the whole country uh, to do so. Uh, this is the system we have. Whether or not we continue to be you know, a beacon for the world, as Lincoln wanted us to be, interesting question. Maybe that was too much of a responsibility to take on anyway. We clearly got carried away uh, in some cases with some of our actions over the years. Uh, um, these elections eventually make it possible for the United States to be a great world power. But being a great world power means you're always getting in trouble. You're doing things people don't like. Uh, you're getting into wars that prove to be very unpopular. What's the best thing to do? Do we leave it to the elite? Do we leave it to the experts? How much should the people say in all this? So if you have other questions for Doug, please stick around and talk to him. But some of you maybe have places to go, things to do. We thank you all for coming today. And let's give Doug one more round of applause.